think like people love VTubing and there's also like people that don't like VTubing and VTubers and um but like I, I just have to say like VTubing is it gives so many people like a chance to be a content creator. Hey everyone, welcome to uh, Visionaries. I uh, this is a our twice weekly live podcast with some of the most influential and popular people in gaming, new media, and the internet. Uh, if you're new here, your first time listening, th- this show is featured in the past people like Ludwig Gagarin um, and others, such as Atrioc. And uh, re- or last week we had Ben Brode, the cr- co-creator of Marvel Snap, the former game director of Hearthstone. Um, as well as, I'm trying to remember who else was on the show last week. My brain is mush. Um, as well as Aiden and Slime to talk about everything going on in Super Smash Brothers. Um, but this is, uh, today we are joined by Code Miko. Yeah, so thank you thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, I think I'm really familiar with your work and sort of everything that you've been doing uh, with the Code Miko character and personality. And I, I kind of just want to start there. How did you come up with code miko and what was your inspiration specifically on the content because i know you have a background in animation and working (laughs) you know decent at nickelodeon and other places so i I know this is like some of your life's work but how did you come up with what the content that you wanted to create with code miko uh, specifically what was the inspiration there um well thank you for having me jake um and um yes inspiration for content amigo came from um, it came from various sources. I first found Twitch and I found that like, you know, I had this idea where it would be cool to have a live character and have a live chat influence things in real time. And from there, my imagination kind of took off and just, I've always also really liked things like, you know, um, you know, Ready Player One. Um, I also love Adult Swim. And so I kind of combined like those two aspects and created like a live show on Twitch with really wacky humor. Yeah. Was, were there specific shows on Adult Swim that like sort of inspired that humor? Um, yeah. I love things like Space Ghost and also uh, Rick and Morty. Um, I love, I don't know if Archer is on Adult Swim, um, but um, Archer is like another cartoon that I really liked. So I, I've just been a really big fan of animation in general because in animation, I feel like you can do like outrageous things. And of course, like South Park isn't exactly all those swim either, but South Park was also an, another favorite of mine. So I always had this like weird, wacky humor and like very exaggerated humor. And I thought I could make a, you know, a similar type of wacky show with animation on Twitch. Did you always want to do it as animation? I mean, I know that you started appearing, you started streaming on Twitch, not as a VTuber originally, and eventually you sort of launched Code Miko and, and the entire show. But did you always want to do animation as the presentation for that? Yeah, I mean, um, so I was basically, I did animation since I was like, I was like 16. Um, so I've, I've always been into animation and whatnot. Um, when I first started Twitch streaming, back way back I just discovered like I discovered the platform I discovered it exists and I was like oh this is like as a hobby I wanted to see uh what it's about and so I streamed a bit as myself and you know later it kind of divulged into devving kind of uh on Twitch as well and it was more like a part-time hobby uh when I first discovered Twitch and it was it wasn't until like I got laid off from the job that I had back in 2020 um, around like the time of COVID and things like that, that I was like, you know, I, I want to, instead of looking for another job, I, I want to like see if I could make this vision I have a real reality. And um, I just went for it and it turned out it, it uh, lucky enough, it turned out to be worth it. How quickly, you know, I remember, I think I, found your content, I wouldn't say early, but somewhere before you kind of got as popular as you are now with it. How long did it take you to build this to be a successful thing for you? Um, so I would say that it initially to launch Comico, it was around four to six months. Um, 
but like Komiko went through a lot of iterations and still going to, through iterations. I, I would say like my Miko project is an ongoing uh, test, <laughs> developing test uh, for uh, you know, a live animation interactive stream. And so, uh, you know, I've been working on it since I started Kumiko until now, um, still updating it, still, you know, putting in new wacky things uh, for chat to play with, uh, putting in some new, you know, ways that Kumiko herself can animate and interact with di different objects and things. And I think that's where a lot of like, because my project is still ongoing, you see like the, you know the the glitches and bugs all live in real time as I test everything on streams and and yeah I would say it's just like an ongoing process but the initial process of creating Komiko took around four months and then um two months like I started streaming four months after and then two more months of just streaming and really going in and developing and back and forth and you famously, I remember you've told a couple of different people you, you've done interviews with about this. You famously went into debt to launch the project, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, I did. I So I, I live in L.A. and <laughs> L.A. is pretty tough when it comes to, you know, uh, rent and all of that. And um, I basically uh, had worked in animation for, you know, for quite a while, you know, for four to six years years i think it was but you know because of like how ex much animation pays and how much you know um rent is in la i never really got to like i i saved up it, i saved up somewhat but it wasn't enough to start the project and so um i put all my savings into just paying my rent and then everything else like my credit card all into, you know, the project and buy my equipment and things like that. What was your motivation to risk all of that? You know, like the, obviously that's a big jump. Were you really confident it was going to take off or were you just that passionate about trying this? Well, I knew that if I, for me, like I, I love my, um, the field that I work in and I love all the you know art aspects and the developing side i loved all of that but the thing that always made me feel depressed and like purposeless in my life was that i was giving so much effort into like another person's you know vision and another person's dreams and another person's you know that that whole like you know putting a thousand percent of yourself out there and getting you know just like a barely enough paycheck to pay my rent and i just felt like um, I just didn't like that life. And so I was like, you know, this is the only chance I got because I got laid off already. You know, if I did get another job, then it's going to be the same thing over and over again. Um, and I, I was like, if I lose, if I don't make it, then fine, I'll get a job. You know, I'll lose my tiny bit of savings that I have. I'll put myself in debt, but I'm sure I have student debt anyway. <laughs> you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go get another yeah. job. But um, I was like, this is, I have to do it. I have to, to do it and see if I can make it. Otherwise, I think I just regret it and be the same state in the next job I get of like wishing I had, you know, tried something. Yeah, I think most of the like independent creative people I know that's like something that's very, I, I hear a lot from them that, and even I feel some of that, you know, creating for your own purposes mm -hmm. rather than creating for the purpose of others. Yeah. And I think like that is, I mean, I guess I would ask, like, you mentioned that that was something that was really bothering you before you were laid off. What, what drove that? I mean, was there some sense of ownership or purpose that or like any moments that made you feel that way in particular that you wanted to, you know, that inspired you to do what you're doing now? Um, I kind of always just been a very, like, you know, whenever, even if I was like, um, even like when I was a child, uh, you know, going to school, um, you had your, you know, homework that you had to do. I always was like the person that just went off and did my own thing. <laughs> um, you know, instead of being like writing that essay, I'd go and, you know, make animation or, um, you know, tinker in things. And um, I kind of just always had that passion to make my own stuff. And so when I um, got a corporate job and was just 
you know, grinding away. And, and the things, and, and I got into this field of, you know, create, creating because I love creative freedom, like the freedom that you get from creativity and being in a corporate environment and having that, like that passion be turned into something that, you know, I didn't like anymore. Um, it like, I think that really drove me really sad because like, I loved doing what I did, but it would turn sour um, when I felt like a cog in the wheel, so to speak. Um, and I couldn't be creative anymore, even though I was in a creative environment, but it didn't feel like it. When you started building the Miko character and building the mocap functionality, the ability to sort of put together this entire show. How, or I guess, in terms of confidence, did you feel like it was going to be successful from the very beginning? Did you think that no. it was like extremely unique? I honestly, I thought I was gonna, I would have been, I, I just wanted enough to make, like, make rent and a little bit more. I was like, that was what I was going for. Um, because like my main thing was just being able to self-sustain myself um, and do what I want to do, which, you know, uh, honest, like it, it, it was, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm very surprised that it went as far as it has gone. Um, so I didn't expect like success. I just expected to, like what my success was at that time was like, if I can make, if I could turn this into a living, um, where I could work for myself and just work and make modest means, like I become successful. You know, I was reading Nathan Grayson's profile of you and uh, from Kotaku last year. And it seemed like reading that piece that there was a little bit of anxiety that you would be permanently suspended or banned from Twitch. Oh. Obviously some of the content that you, some of the content that you've done more generally is it, can be provocative at times. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's part of the humor, obviously. Yeah. Um, were you worried that that, like truly worried that that was going to be yeah. something you were going to have to deal with being yeah. put, up, put off the platform? I mean, I still am worried, but I think like they've, they didn't know what to do with me when I first came on to Twitch. Cause um, I was doing really strange things. Like, you know, um, does an avatar, you know, like for example, um, I got banned for showing my thigh, my avatar's thigh, but I thought it was fine because she was wearing like a cool RPG type of armor type of like, like things that you would just see in a like video game, right? Like you see girls, uh, the concept are on video games and they're they're like she wasn't even scantily clad it was just that she was showing a bit too much hip and thigh on one side um and then i got banned for that and i, I and i at the time i was kind of like well she's a video game character so you know is that really this the same <laughs> as you know a real person um and then i and then i got Banned for, um, I made this fun little joke where I programmed this thing where if chat spends a dollar, um, I had a little cell, Miko had a little, Miko had like a little cell phone. And when chat spent like a dollar, a letter D would pop up on her phone. And the, and the joke was, you sent me a D pick. It was like a stupid joke, but it was a joke. <laughs> um, and and I basically got banned for soliciting pornography. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and and then, and then so um, I think Twitch just didn't know what to do with me because <laughs> I, I guess like it's just something that they don't they haven't really dealt with before or seen before. Um, so I guess they didn't really fully understand what was actually happening there. But um, I guess in their mind, I was actually selling D pics, but it was letter d you know hearing you talk about that it makes me think a lot about makes me think a lot about amaranth actually yeah. who i think like you they've struggled to figure out what to do with her for a long time as well you know like they would they would ban her off the platform they eventually ultimately like changed categories right yeah, and, yeah. and released the pools beaches 
um, and hot tubs category because like they just didn't understand like how to deal with the sort of the changing landscape. I mean, they're, they're a website we've talked about endlessly on this podcast that just like, just it's very, it struggles a lot with moderation struggles with like transparency. They're a very complex website for as big as they are. And, and so hearing you talk about like your own thing being one of the, you know, one of the more popular VTubers, like clearly is uh, you're pioneering in a category against a website that doesn't even know how to deal with certain things on a regular basis, much less something unique. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, I do think I am around a lot when I hear that because I think she's gone through a little bit of the same. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I would even say that um, Amaroth is in a way less sexual <laughs> than um, Code Miko sometimes because Miko makes a lot of jokes. <laughs> uh, Amaroth does not make any jokes. Uh, she's, uh, she's, uh, when I, when I, she came over to my place and we did a stream together, um, I love just making fun of stuff and I love making fun in just the situation. And, um, you know, I made some, some like just jokes on the line of like, like, uh, Oh look, like two two girls, uh, you know, it's, it's something like a sexual joke, right? Um, and then she got so paranoid. She was like, "You can't do that. You can't make jokes like that." I was like, "Oh shit!" Um, it, it's you. And then she told me that, like, basically, like you, it, basically, in her mind, how toss and all that works is like you can look. People can look all they want, but you yourself can't acknowledge it <laughs> which is so funny yeah yeah i think have you communicated more with twitch do you feel more secure there now than you did a year ago i think that they understand my content like when like when miko is like because i do outrageous as i said i try to be like adult swim where i just do really outrageous stuff um like miko projectile vomits you know and miko you know farts skittles out of her butt uh when you know when she does things like that it's not sexual <laughs> it's just stupid <laughs> and i i want them to understand they understand that it's just stupid and not sexual now which is great yeah i think that i want to ask you about the community part of that because you were talking about like the the whole like D pick thing, but also more more broadly, I think over time your project has become more of a community project. Obviously, you're you're the lead designer here, like you're the one putting in the the effort and running the actual character and doing all the the animatronics and uh, mocap, but and voice. But you know, you I see you like soliciting feedback on the on the project and like what you should do with it on both on Twitch and on social media. Mm -hmm. And what is what has been the sort of inspiration to bring the community more in it rather than just like, you know, saying out your own creative ideas? Um, yeah, honestly, like I, I've kind of decided to take a bit of like a month or two to really experiment with my channel. Um, and when I first originally did, set out to do Clomico, I wanted to basically create miniature interactive games for people to play with and have Clomico participate with the community so um so the medium of like gameplay mixed with live watching you know you know it just hasn't been done before and i really wanted to see you know if there was like a new medium that you could really explore and have it do better than the traditional live streaming you know medium and um i wanted to see like you know what kind of you know interactions what kind of miniature games do you guys find fun uh what do you want in like your like what, what do you what do you want as a community if you could play directly with comigo and um i've basically you know started to create these little like really fast miniature games with the community um and just been seeing how they do and you know um i would say that like my audience has become a lot more tighter and closer uh and a bit more fervent because of, of like because it is very unique and it is very like community uh, feedback focused now um but it is like a balancing act where 
you know, now that I've gone and done all, all that stuff, it's it's also time for me to kind of go back and do things that are uh, more traditional as well to just kind of balance out the content and um, and um, have it be more accessible, so to speak. So yeah, it's like a balancing act. Yeah, I find you talking about that first part really interesting because that's like the Twitch plays Pokemon yeah. type like idea, right? But obviously, like that's a that's a game that somebody just programmed to run controls off of uh, whatever is inputted in chat. Whereas, like you're sort of reacting. What what is the most outlandish request that you have had someone make of Mika? Out of curiosity. Um. Hmm. Trying to think. Most outlandish. Um, I oh gosh, I already do things that's so outlandish that it's tough to say if they've ever requested anything outlandish. I mean, they've asked for OnlyFans. <laughs> I guess that's outlandish. Um, I've created things that are outlandish for sure i created this fart rocket thing where if you um pay f- like if you pay a certain amount of bits she farts out of her butt and then she turns into a rocket and she goes into space and she explodes and there's fireworks like you know really really dumb stuff like really really dumb interactive stuff um but yeah i i don't think i've i don't think i've had a viewer ask for anything more outlandish than what i've already currently have yeah, that's, uh, I mean, what made what made the character and, like, the stream really popular to begin with was pretty was pretty out there being able to, like, kill the character or, you know, yeah. maybe shut up for 30 seconds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, I think uh, in ter- and when it came to an interview format, that was really popular because it made the other person awkward or not know how to react to it. And, um, yeah, I definitely want to bring some of that back more too did you struggle at first to sort of you know because i mean obviously you're here on an interview show we've been interviewing a lot of people over the past like four or five months but like you know it's hard to book people there like big streamers that are relevant did yeah did you struggle with that originally originally no um originally i was too scared to ask people Uh, when when my stuff started picking up momentum um i got really lucky that and my clips started to circulate in LSF and all the bigger streamers kind of became more like aware of me. And then um, I got really lucky in that a lot of them reached out themselves. And when they did that, it gave me the confidence to reach out to others because um, I was like, oh man, if this person is reaching out to me, maybe I could ask this person. And then, um, and they were really down to do it. And I was surprised. I was shocked, but it, but it's like I think I was very lucky during that time because like booking and scheduling people is, oh man, I think that's the main reason why I stopped doing the interview show was because I uh, streamers are very busy people and it's so hard to log down a date and have it be logged <laughs> um, that I, I was like, you know, I want to do this as a, like a seasonal thing where. I have a season where I'm like, okay, it's time to do a bunch of interviews, you know, and then, and then just do it, focus and do it. But like all the other times, and I'm not in that season of interviewing, I want to do other things. I want to do my passion project of like making fun miniature games for my Twitch chat to play with or um, creating some, or like just getting more ridiculous with my tech as well. Um, You know, seeing like, like right now, I really want to play with like the vibe trackers and um, get vibe trackers to look as good as like my motion capture suit. Um, like you know, fun projects like that that I want to like. My my audience has become like a mixture of people that love watching me develop and also like watch the interactive side of it too. So, um, yeah, so both of those things. Well, I think that's what's interesting, right? Is like you're. Something when I talk to a lot of streamers, especially the ones, yeah, there are people like Ludwig and others who have started to do other things like off-brand and putting together these events and like constantly challenging themselves in that way. 
But the streamers that are just chatting streamers, kind of spur of the moment, or gaming streamers who are just playing games every time they turn on a camera, when I talk to those people, they tend to get really uninspired because it's like kind of just the same thing over and over and over again. But I think what's unique with you, and I want to ask you about this, is like that development is a challenge. Does that like kind of help push your motivation to continue going forward? Yeah. Is that challenge? Yeah. Honestly, I have the most fun when I'm creating new things. Um, and like when you create something and it does well or it works, it's like the greatest <laughs> feeling. Um, it's like you you battle through it. You know, you fix all your bugs, and then you get new bugs, and then things just don't work. Things break, and then when you finally get it to work, and then it looks awesome, I get so much joy from that. Um, and that that kind of stuff is actually outside of my stream, and it's it's I've I'm actually discovering a lot about myself where uh, I'm realizing I actually have way more fun creating and being behind the scenes rather than in front of the scenes. Um, which is very interesting. So, but yeah, I, I definitely just love creating. I can imagine in a way too, that before you started doing more of the dev stuff, yeah. when it was more so you just VTube the entire time, it like, is that acting tiring? Like in, in a way being able to keep up the character? Cause not only are you physically having to do motions with the mocap, but you're yeah. also having to be the person, be like something different yourself, right? Yeah. Like it, it is acting in a way. Yeah. Is it, that tiring? Um, I would say that like it, it, compared to like a normal to sit down and I'm, um, you know, tinkering on stream, uh, I could tinker for eight to 10 hours and do eight to 10 hour streams. When I'm called Miko, I can only do like three to five hours. Uh, Cause yeah, it is, it does take a lot of ener energy and um, you just, you know, it, it's you're moving in your entire body, and then you're also remembering all your keybinds, and um, yeah, you it's definitely tiring for sure. Um, that's why I, I'm like kind of, um, well, I, I am creating like my my company Mikoverse is creating um, a way for you to do VTubing without motion capture and all that, like, uh, so like. Once we're kind of like done with our um, second alpha, it would make my it's gonna make my life so much easier because I won't have to get into a mocap suit. I could just turn on turn on a webcam and be Komiko. So I can't wait until we're we're finished with our second alpha. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that too. Is is making it more accessible? You know, you started in an era. VTubing existed before you started Komiko, but it was still like relatively new. I think it's only gotten more and more popular with time yeah. as a creative means of expression. And obviously now you're contributing to that in the way with technology. What do you think about how it's grown as, as a way for people to express themselves and, and the community around it as well? Yeah, I think that VTubing is such a... There's a... like. I think like people love VTubing and there's also like people that don't like VTubing and VTubers and um but like I, I just have to say like VTubing is it gives so many people like a chance to be a content creator. Um people that, you know, don't necessarily wanna come on the camera. Uh, people that wish to be anonymous, but they love all the creative aspects of, you know, live streaming. And like, I feel like VTubing just allows, you know, these types of people to be able to do creative things um, without having to put themselves out there. And I think it's such a gift. Um, and I'm just like, I'm really happy that the VTuber, VTubing community is growing. And um, I, I hope it keeps on growing. And I think one thing that I want to contribute and help with is, um, I think there's a, uh, fewer 3D VTubers. And I think that's because the 3D VTubing is just harder to set up. Um, it's, you know, but like 3D VTubing has so many different styles that you can do, you know, like you can go for like the Disney character or you can have go for like the Pixar look or you can go for like a game character look. There's so many styles that I think people can, you know, relate to and do. And um, what I'm hoping to contribute with my app that I'm building is like, 
for for anyone to be able to do that easily and for people not people don't have to have a ten thousand dollar mocap suit or people don't have to spend hours and hours of engineering or developing or you know all of that um and just make it easier easier for them to be whoever they want to be you know for their avatars and how far into development are you guys into putting together the the app itself so um our so our app our second alpha which is going to be july um it's going to be open for very selective people um that will have you know the webcam tracking where you don't have to have a motion capture suit um and you can do like the very minimal uh of becoming like a 3d vtuber um, so that's coming out like in July to very selective people. And then our goal, this is kind of an ambitious goal, but our goal is by the end of 2023 to have uh, an app available for all um, and anyone can use it. How difficult has it been to like work on the technology behind this? Because I can imagine that tracking and then being able to sort of render it out is is. Yeah. Pretty difficult, especially making it accessible to people who don't have good computers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's a it's a very big project. Um, it's not like it's not just tracking too. It's like it's 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 also networking. Um, you know, different. You know, so that you could have your own servers, so that you can have your friends, and you know, uh, so that you're not a single player VTuber as well. So it's it's a massive project, and um, it's been the hardest thing is is um, juggling my Komiko project and also Mikoverse uh, because both of them are one is a startup, which is a full time job, which is like more than a full time job. And the other is contagration, which also is another more than a full time job. So I think um, I have definitely struggled a lot in balancing both. And it, it, it it's like, if I it, it's it's like, um, oh, man, it, it, I don't really have a life. <laughs> I would say yeah, it's really hard to have a life. Um, it's been it's been very difficult yeah i feel that i like i've not only run overcome and host the show but also write a newsletter and so i feel you i'm doing like 70 hours of work a week it's it's a lot yeah so that juggle is difficult you have to kind of maintain yeah and, and also like finding the right people hiring the right people um so that you know you can lend off a lot of your work as well um it's it's all all like that's what i'm hoping to do is just keep making my team bigger and bigger so that i could you know not wear as many hats how many people are on the team now currently right now we're uh 10 so we got 10 people and uh we're wearing a lot of different hats (laughs) because we were a small company we're a startup small company and in terms of how you're being able to fund that, I would imagine you're using some of the Code Miko funds to pay everyone and to set this up. But have you taken on any investment to date? No, I, all of it is investment. Um, Ecoverse is 100% uh, VC backed um, uh, project. And Code Miko is actually separate from Ecoverse um, in that everything that is developed in Code Miko is actually. Uh, outside of Mikoverse, and um, it's uh, it's it's done by me and one other engineer part time, um, but the rest is pretty much because uh, the Mikoverse app is very different in that you kind of have to. Oh man, how do I explain this? It's like it, it's like the foundational. Uh, the foundations of Mikoverse app is completely different than the ones on Komiko. So um, Komiko is like a good MVP for it, but uh, Mikoverse and Komiko are completely different projects. If that makes sense. My my goal is to move Komiko onto Mikoverse. Got it. So you're yeah. not having to, like you said, you're not having to full-time mocap all the time. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. That's, that's the goal? Yeah. 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 Makes sense. In terms of sort of the the market that you see for the Mikoverse app, I want to ask you about that. The like, 
How many people do you see using an app like like the Makeoverse app when you all are done with it and launch publicly? Hopefully, um, people will find the app uh, easy to use um, and very accessible to use. That will take some time, but I hope that you know it, we would succeed if we did a good enough job making the app easy to use and accessible for anybody that wants to be, become VTubers. So, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just curious. You know, I like. Hopefully. Obviously, I know other people that are v, VTubers besides just yourself, but like, you know, it's clearly isn't becoming an interest. I'm just like very curious how many people want to do that, right? Like, that's the. It, it's the same. Like, it's the same question I have with like innovative technologies, like VR as well, right? Like, they're fun. Yeah. But like, in terms of like people using them all the time enough to like really make it, you know, commercially successful, et cetera. That's yeah. what I'm curious about. So, so it's not. So it's not just for VTubing in the in the sense of moving your character and motion capturing it. It's actually playing a another having another online presence. So uh, one of the things that we have in there and are developing actively is a really good third person character that you can play around and role play with. So um, like an example is the GTA RP community is really huge and um, colorful and they, they role play their characters without having to be a VTuber. Um, and so on top of, you know, having like the webcam tracking and motion capture and all of that uh, and VR and stuff like that. We also have, you know, third person character where you can just role play with a keyboard and mouse. And, and I feel like that's kind of going to be the most of our users will just be keyboard and mouse for now, since, you know, VR still has to be more accessible, I think. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different technology that just needs to be more accessible, but one thing that people have been doing for a long time is having an avatar in the presence of whatever it, it could be you know like like how they have minecraft or roblox or even you go all the way back even to like neopets where you know you had an online presence and you had your you know your identity um i think that's what is really the um the the biggest accessibility of playing a different character um for most people. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, de we're definitely thinking about that and actively, um, having that as, uh, you know, our, our, our solutions for the greater accessibility of being a second life character. Um, you know, the, the one thing about me, or I want to ask Mikoverse has no sort of web three integrations at all. Correct. No. What has been the, you know, obviously there's a ton of people out there that are creating metaverses and I've like, I've covered a bunch of them. I think most of them are pretty ridiculous and like, you know, they're, you know, using certain language to get investment that yeah. when they don't have a real product that's yeah. meaningful, um, why not take advantage of that? I guess like, you know, if you're, I'm sure you could, as, as popular as you are and with the technology you're building, I'm sure you could go raise um, way more money than you already have. I, I guess why not lean? I I just I so the main reason why I'm doing this app is, you know, um, it is. I mean, there's a few, but one it's really like you know I'm a content creator and I play a VTuber. Um, what can I do to make this process the best um, for you know anybody that wants to be a VTuber and, and you know. Be an avatar and um you know because because i'm a content creator and because i kind of live in this space i have like i know what i would want as a content creator and i would know like i know what i would want in my app and um and whatnot i would say like i just i'm not familiar enough with web3 and um and you know crypto and all of that to you know, build an app around it or feel like an expert around it. Um, so he, I know what you mean um, as well, but it just doesn't feel right. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, to be fair, I think a lot of the people working in that space also don't know what it means. Yeah. And they're just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They're <laughs> just using it because it's like kind of the, the hype to do. Yeah. You know, like even if it's, even if they don't understand it fully. I, I also just, I'm, I've never pl- played around with crypto. Um, I've, you know, when the whole NFT thing was happening, there was, you know, a lot of talks about like, oh, NFTs are perfect for like virtual worlds. And, and it, you know, in a, in a way, like if you have, if you're trying to possess like a digital item um, and you are living inside a virtual space and that was like a, the Ready Player One was already a reality and all that now, like that would make sense. But like at this point in time, like, you know, NFTs just don't make any sense. And I, I I, I will admit that I don't really know much about the crypto space, but um, I, I've just been kind of staying, you know, just I haven't I just haven't really been diving into it because it's just not like um, or like the focus or um, what we're trying to create, I guess. Yeah. 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 Before we get to audience questions, I wanted to ask you this because, you know, what you're building to me, when you're explaining kind of everything you want to do with the Makoverse app, it seems like something that someone like Roblox would buy <laughs> if given the opportunity. Um, you know, like they, they're like the perfect sort of suitor for something like right, like that, right? Like that you already mentioned that people are already escaping into these like virtual identities mm-hmm. and they're one of the biggest companies to provide that outlet at the moment um and they also like you they allow people to be extremely creative right in the way that they want to be creative but then i think about what you talked about at the beginning of the show which is like you know being in control of your own destiny and the creative freedom that you have owning what you do the work that you do i guess like do you see an exit in the future for something like Ecoverse, and and does it worry you the like if if that's the case, sort of giving you know selling what you everything you built, considering all the motivations that led you to create Code Miko in the first place? I think that for me now, um, having built my company and working with everybody that's in the company, I honestly at this point now. Um, if some if there was an exit where everybody in my company can benefit and they can, you know, make a lot of money from it, and um, then I would I would want to take care of the people that I work for of work that work for me. So um, if there's a scenario where, you know, everybody can, you know, make you know if 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 our company exits and it exits well exits well and everybody can have that you know, more of that financial freedom, um, I would definitely, you know, choose to award my, you know, the people that, that work for me, you know, over anything else I would, I would say, I would say. And we'll, we'll end on this before the audience questions. You mentioned that you enjoy being behind the scenes more and obviously being the CEO of a startup, if things go well, if Mikoverse is commercially successful, the and you're not so dependent on Code Miko and the streaming life as a primary source of revenue for you and sustainability in your life, is there a world where you see yourself walking away from Code Miko and no longer doing that? Um, yeah, I actually. Um, so, uh, I, I also just want to go back to your last question as well. Um, just want to add that we don't have plans to exit. <laughs> Um, at all. Um, it's only if there was a really, really good, good exit and it benefited everybody. That was the only, only time we would actually do that. But uh, we, yeah, we definitely want it to go all the way and have it be very, very commercially successful. Um, uh, in terms of like me and Komiko and walking away from Komiko, I think Komiko will always become, be like a hobby of mine that I just want to continue doing, but never in the same like grind or same like, um, I, I got to get on every, you know, Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday to Sunday, you know, I had my, my, my YouTube videos every this time and this day, like the grind, I would say, like, I don't think I would do. I think the grind would all go to Mikoverse and uh, Kumiko would just be like a hobby project that I, you know, I do when I want to do it. And I produce every content I produce 
would be something that I would be very proud of um, instead of like, because nowadays it's like, I have to get on because I have to grind. Um, but I would love that freedom of like not grinding <laughs> and just making what I want to make that I'm proud of. All right. I lied. I have one more question. Cause I, I, yeah, you recently ran the, the stream or you recently won a streamy award for the best VTuber um, and our VTuber of the year, whatever the official award name is. And oh, first of all, congratulations. That's, that's a big deal. And second of all, you know, it's, you're inspiring a lot of people in your space. I, I know you are because I talk to other people that are getting into VTubing oh, and they mention you. you as an inspiration for what you're or what they're trying to do and how they're trying to differentiate. What's the ceiling here? I mean, I, I, I would imagine you have to think about like how far you can go. What's the next cool thing you can do? Yeah. And like, that's hard. I can imagine mm -hmm. Like, I, I imagine it's hard to like constantly come up with something that's different. Yeah. And you don't fall back into that category of just like turning on the camera. Yeah. It, you know, what, what do you think the ceiling is here for, for your ability to be Code Miko and, and the types of activities and things you can do on stream? Um, um, I think with Code Miko, I always just want to innovate. Um, and it is like a passion project where, you know, I, like I just, whatever creative thing I come up with, I just want to do and see how people can, can be entertained by it. Um, I think like Kumiko in terms of, and that way Kumiko doesn't really have a ceiling. It's just because I'm just creating whatever I want to create and um, entertaining people. I, I think like my main goal really is um, like really is like, it's I think my main goal goes beyond VTubing and and more about making this tech more accessible for more people. I think that's really where my passion lies um, in, in like and just innovating in that way, if that makes sense. And Kumiko is more like I have her to entertain people and, you know, get my creative uh, storytelling side out through Miko. But um, yeah, I, I would say like in terms of, that's why I don't think there really is a, I don't, I don't know if I'm interpreting your question right, but I feel like that's why I don't feel like there's a ceiling. Yeah. I was just like asking if there, if, you know, if you think about like, if there's like ever, if you think about like what, what all you can do, and if you think there's ever a way for you to kind of hit like where you run out of ideas. Right. And, and what that looks like. Cause obviously you've done so much this year uh -huh. and in the past couple of years, but like I can imagine it's difficult to continually come up with something new. Oh yeah. Yeah. It is very difficult. Um, what the next thing that I want to do is more um, event type things. And once like, like for example, my Mikoverse app, it kind of allows the technology allows like multiple VTubers to collaborate in the same space and travel to their own levels and, own houses and whatnot. And so uh, with that tech, I want to create some more cool like event type streams. Um, you know how the IRL streamers are doing like, you know, yesterday was checks boxing or um, there's really cool like shit camp and, and things like that. I want to do, I want to be able to create stuff like that in the virtual space. And um, we're, we're making that happen by, you know, building our, our app, our servers and networking, um, all of that inside our, our Mikoverse thing. So, um, yeah, that's like my next project. That sounds really exciting. Yeah. I think that being able to off, I mean, in a way it's like, is new and novel, but it, it's almost like not right. Like the MMOs and other games have had that type of stuff for a long time, yeah. but it's not been like that where you're like creating kind of your own thing. Yeah. And, you know, if, I know you said like, you know, you're going to have mouse and keyboard functionality anyway, but being able to do it with the motion tracking too, as an option for people, like yeah. that's extremely novel. Yeah. Even if, even if the concept of events and games is not. Yeah. It's, it's basically a social platform. It's unlike, I mean, a lot of MMOs are social platforms as well, but it's, um, that's like not the focus, right? Like Miku versus like the focus is social platform. Um, that is content creator driven. 
Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's it's a lot of the metaverse projects you hear about, but yeah. with like some actual substance <laughs> because you've already done some you've already done some legwork, right? Like you've already you, yeah. know, you already have a successful VTube career, and you've shown that you like understand you personally, the person running the company yeah. understands like the product rather yeah. than you know just like kind of coming in it. Yeah, or, you know, and there's a lot of metaverse no companies for sure. Um, and I think one competitive edge that we have is that you're right, like that we, I am a VTuber and I know exactly like what that feels like. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, you have a use case. You mentioned earlier MVP, minimum viable product. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That you, yeah, you, you are like what the stuff that you've already done, right, is exactly that. Yeah. So. We invited a listener to come ask a question. They had a good one. Uh, Mick, Mickamized, I believe, is their username. Uh, so this is kind of related to what you were just talking about. Um, but early in the Code Miko project, you talked some about, like, uh, and you had some demos for, like, integrating third-person control with kind of, like, video game world's uh, mechanics. And you were kind of and probably still do like a transition between mocap and this like third person view is the stuff you're talking about with uh, the Mikoverse kind of an extension of that. Yeah. Um, so yes, um, you can go from your like, mocap to third person, or you could just be third person game character uh, if you don't do mocap. Um, and yeah, like when you're a third person, like you can go and do a lot more than, you know, motion capture in a way because you can go travel to different places around your apartment, your house, um, to different neighborhoods or different worlds. You can play like a video game as well with your friends. So um, I really think that third person gameplay is super important in a digital space, at least for now. Uh, I'm sure, you know, in some amount of years, we'll get to that whole really realistic matrix ready play one style. But um, for now, it's, it is like, you know, uh, the most viable option, I think. Cool. And I, I'm going to tack on one kind of additional question, which is, um, are y'all working on any kind of like uh, webcam based, like motion capture or expression capture? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she, said, she said, yeah, yeah. She said yes to that earlier that she was working on tracking. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, because like I, I need it for myself. <laughs> As, as a VTuber that streams almost every day, I need it. <laughs> I hate putting on my mocap suit. Um, and I'll, I'll tack on one thing, too. In terms of, you know, your sort of... Uh, in terms of being able to use the, the Mikoverse technology to do other things. So if someone wanted to use what you're building to just stream on Twitch or whatever it may yeah. be, is that a part of your plan as well? Or is it going to solely be focused on, on the MMO? Oh, yeah, they can definitely. I mean, it, I'll be using it to stream on my Twitch um, and create YouTube videos and things like that. Um, so, yeah, for sure. You know, pop it onto the OBS, you know, um, it's... It's just another engine that you can use to stream with. Well, we'll end there. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you, Miko, for joining us on the pod. Um, this was really insightful. Definitely covered a lot of topics we had not before on the show, so I do appreciate that. Thank you so much for everyone tuning in. We will be back this Wednesday with another guest. I just want to tell the audience that if you guys are you know, seriously interested in becoming like a VTuber, um, you can email me because <laughs> um, we are we are you know going through a bunch of people and seeing who's like the best for alpha testing and things like that. So um, you know my email is codemikoproject at gmail dot com. So if you're interested in becoming an alpha tester, just email me or you can also just visit our website uh, mikoverseinc dot com. So anyway, thank you guys. Thank you, <laughs> Jacob. No problem. Thank you all so much, and uh, yeah, we will see you on Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. All right, bye. Thanks for watching Visionaries on YouTube. For more content, please subscribe to the Overcome channel.